special guest here this morning. Most of you probably already know that. Brian Osborne is here to see us today. And more importantly, he's here to speak for us today. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pray and we'll, we'll let him come up and talk to you. Father, we thank you so much for the day. We thank you for the opportunity to, to hear from Brian Osborne today, who will be carrying words from you. Lord, I pray that you'll speak through him. You will use him today for your glory. And Lord, uh, we pray for the edification of the saints today. We pray, Lord, that you will reach the lost. We pray that uh, you will just help us to understand you better and grow nearer to you. We pray for your blessing on Brian as he comes up to speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, hello. Good morning. How are you? Very good. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm from Answers in Genesis. You probably saw the sign behind me. Who's already familiar with Answers in Genesis? Maybe just a little bit. Who's familiar a lot? Very good. Who's been to the Creation Museum? Who's been to the Ark? Who's been to neither? There's time to repent. Okay, it's all right. <laughs> uh, welcome this morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, we're, going to do a, we're having a whole conference this weekend, this Sunday, tomorrow as well, covering a lot of issues. Uh, our first session this morning, though, will be more of a techie kind of session, a lot of science in here, a lot of answers. Our next session will be why this is so important, connecting it to biblical authority. So if you get scared by this session, don't worry. It's a lot of information. There's a point to it all. Uh, but next session, we're going to really drive home why we do all this, how it relates to sharing the gospel in a secular culture, and why it's so important for defending biblical authority. So it's kind of the flow forward this morning. Uh, really, if you don't know Answers to Genesis or are not really familiar with it, let me just say this up front. We are not a creation versus evolution ministry. That's not who we are. Some people peg us as that, but that's not correct. We are a biblical authority ministry, defending the authority of God's word, where it's being attacked today, so we can then proclaim the gospel boldly in a secular culture and prevent our kids from falling away like so many are. And that's really the heartbeat of who we are. That's the purpose behind the Ark and County. You may have heard we rebuilt Noah's Ark over in Williamstown, Kentucky, a little bit south of Florence, Kentucky, right below Cincinnati, probably around four hours, roughly four and a half hours away from here. Uh, fantastic structure, built with a purpose of answering questions, defending the faith, and sharing the gospel. Same thing with the museum. If you've been to the museum, you know, we walk you through biblical history with the seven seas of history, and we answer the skeptical questions of this age, defending the faith, showing God's word is true. And we believe this is so important in our day and age because God's word is is under attack today. Have you noticed that? It's pretty obvious, right? It's not hard to see. It's under attack. And it's been under attack since Genesis chapter 3, but the way it's being attacked today is by attacking the history of the Bible, getting people to doubt the credibility of the Bible by undermining its authority by attacking that history. And so nowadays people believe you can't trust the Bible because evolution is true, and ape men is true, and Big Bang is true, and therefore you can't trust what the Bible says about history. But if we cannot believe the Bible's history, why on earth would you trust what it says about salvation? Right? If you cannot trust Genesis 1-1, why would you trust John 3-16? That won't make any sense. And for so many people today, it's one of the primary reasons they reject the gospel. Because they think the Bible has been disproved. And that's why we need answers to these sort of questions in our day and age. And that's why we need answers to questions like this one. Do animals evolve? <laughs> All right? <laughs> <laughs> That's our topic for this morning, defining the word evolution. Uh, and of course, according to our culture, no, evolution is an absolute fact. It's not even a question, even according to our pop culture. Let me give you an example of this from a, a show you might recognize called Friends. Or evolution. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't, uh, you don't believe in evolution? No, not really. <laughs> You don't believe in evolution? I don't know. It's just, you know, <clears throat> monkeys, Darwin. You know, it's a, it's a nice story. I just think it's a little too easy. <laughs> too easy? Too <laughs> the process of every living thing on this planet evolving over millions of years from single-celled organisms is, is too easy? Yeah, I just don't buy it. <laughs> uh, excuse me. <laughs> evolution is not for you to buy. Phoebe. Evolution is scientific fact, like, like, like the air we breathe, like gravity. All right. Is that true? Is evolution like air or gravity? 
Well, it depends on what you mean by the word evolution. The word itself has multiple meanings. And that's not weird. Most words do have multiple meanings depending on context. But there's only one possible meaning to the word evolution that is what you might call scientific. There's only one possible meaning to the word evolution that is observable, testable, repeatable, and falsifiable. All the other meanings to the word evolution are believed by faith. And so what I want to show you during the session, we'll go through some five different possible meanings to the word evolution. We're going to talk about what we observe with real science and then what else is believed by faith. And when we do that, we see that God's word is confirmed time and time again. So here we go. The first type of evolution you need for the origin of everything, according to the secularist, the non-believer, would be cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, and matter. And according to the secularist, it all began with a big bang. You've heard about the big bang, right? The idea that around 14 billion years ago, nothing exploded and produced everything. That is the Big Bang. That's the general idea of the theory. This is what this uh, textbook teaches. It says around 18 to 20 billion years ago. Nowadays, they say around 14 billion years ago. It's an older textbook. All the matter in the universe. Quick little side note here. The word universe comes from two Latin words. Uni, which means single, and verse, spoken sentence. Do you realize that technically we live in a single spoken sentence? And God said, let there be. It's pretty awesome when you think about it, right? But anyway, back to the textbook. It says, all the matter in the universe was concentrated to a very dense, very hot region that may have been smaller than a period on this page. And then for some unknown reason, this period exploded, and that's called the Big Bang. But where did the dot come from? Where did the matter originally come from? Discover Magazine, 2002. Where did it all come from? If you can read the subcaption in this little box here, it says actual size of the universe, essentially right after birth. And they know that from the digital photographs they took while they were there when it was taking place, right? Yeah. And they're showing you. <laughs> but you zoom in at the bottom. It says universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero nada. And as it got bigger, it became, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. So if you really break it down, you have two options as far as the origin of the universe. You can either choose to believe the words of the eyewitness creator God, who says in the beginning he created the heavens and the earth, or you can choose to believe the words of fallible, sinful men who weren't there, who say in the beginning nothing created everything. You have to choose to believe one of those two starting assumptions because no man was there, only God. And that's why we say over and over again, guys, this is not, I repeat, not a science versus religion issue, as is propped up all the time in our culture and in the media. This is actually a religion versus religion issue. These are two different interpretations of the same evidence based on two different foundational worldviews. Really, it's a battle between the two foundational religions of this world. You see, at a foundational level, there are only two religions. Either God's word is true, and we build our thinking from that, or it's not and man's word in some way, shape, or form becomes the ultimate authority. You have to choose one of those two starting points. And that's why we repeat, repeat all the time as a ministry, this is ultimately a worldview issue. Because all scientists, whether they're secular or biblical, they've got the same stuff in the present. The same rock layers, the same fossils, the same radioisotopes, the same distant starlight, the same DNA, and on it goes. But they interpret this stuff differently and get different conclusions about what they're looking at based on their different starting assumptions, based on their different worldviews. And if you start with the wrong assumptions, you will more than likely get the wrong what? The wrong conclusions, right? Reminds me of the story of a little boy who was at the uh, doctor's office with his mom waiting in the waiting room. And he happened to see a very pregnant lady sitting across the room. So he walked over to her like little boys do. And he said, excuse me, miss, why is your belly so big? <laughs> She said, well, I'm having a baby. He was confused. And he said, and the baby's in your stomach? She said, oh, yeah. He said, well, is he a good baby? She said, oh, yeah, he's a real good baby. To which the boy responded in horror, well, then why did you eat him? <laughs> I know it's silly, right? But you get the idea. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And guys, secular scientists have reached some really wrong conclusions about certain things, like the age of the earth and the rock layers and the fossils and the dinosaurs. Why? Because they're starting with the wrong assumptions. They've elevated man's word over God's word. But if you choose to do that and believe man's word over God's and choose to believe in the Big Bang, then you've got some pretty tough questions to answer. Questions like, where did the matter come from? Secular scientists have no good ideas. Questions like, where did the laws of nature come from? 
because laws of nature are, are immaterial. But where do you get those in a material-only universe if you believe in atheistic beliefs, right? Uh, and by the way, if evolution is true and everything changes over time randomly, why don't the laws of nature randomly change over time? Why haven't the laws of physics or gravity randomly, randomly changed over time? Why hasn't gravity changed? Why don't you weigh 10 pounds more than you used to? Well, we might, but it's not because gravity changed. Amen? It stayed the same. But why is that? Makes sense within a biblical worldview, not within an evolutionary worldview. And, of course, where did the energy come from to run this place? And, again, secular scientists have no good ideas. And the reason being is because this idea violates one of the most fundamental laws in science, something called the first law of thermodynamics. And if something is a law in science, here's what that basically means. We have never seen anything to the contrary. Never. And one of the basic tenets of this law is that we have never seen something come from nothing. Never. And you know, I can't imagine a bigger violation of this law than the idea of nothing exploding and producing everything. Evolution violates many laws of science. We'll see more as we go. But here will be the mantra you will hear, whether it's from uh, Richard Dawkins or Stephen Hawking or Bill Nye or National Geographic or the Discovery Channel or NOVA. Here's what you hear over and over again. Yes, we know it violates laws, and we know we don't know how it worked yet, but somehow nature found a way. One day we'll figure it out. That's the mantra. We don't know, but nature did it somehow. Maybe one day we'll figure it out. That's what you'll hear over and over and over again. So after nature found a way for nothing to explode, then you need to get stellar and planetary evolution, the origin of stars and planets. Let's start with the stars first. Do you realize no one has never actually observed a star forming? I can show you a bunch of quotes just like this one from other secular scientists who say the silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is that we don't know how a single one of these stars managed to form. Never actually seen the process take place. Now, they've got the nebula hypothesis they're very fond of that suggests, well, it's a guess, that suggests we have these gas and dust clouds out in space that begin to spin and collapse. And as the gas and dust collapses, that causes a whole lot of friction. A fusion starts in the middle. That's where the star is born. And then the gas and dust clump together around the star, and that forms your planets. It's called the nebula hypothesis. And there are beautiful gas and dust clouds out in space called nebula, and they're gorgeous. And they tend to be light years across. They're usually gigantic. But here's the thing, as we watch these clouds in the present, all we ever observe them doing is they're always, always expanding, never contracting. Why? You do the simple math, the pressure of the gas pushing out is over a million times greater than the force of gravity trying to draw it in. Gas is very powerful. And there's a joke in there somewhere I'm not touching, all right? But you get the idea, okay? So we we'll leave that alone. But it is. And even though we've never seen a star actually form, it's been estimated, there's enough of them out there, that every person on planet Earth could own 11 trillion to themselves. And that's just the ones we know about. There's even more than that. And to get that many stars, even in 20 billion years, we should see 6 million forming every minute. We should observe 100,000 every second. We don't see one. We do see them blow up from time to time. It's called a nova or a supernova. It's a really big explosion. Now, right now, on average, a star blows up around every 30 years. So, if we've been around for billions of years, we should see millions of supernova remnants. How many do we actually observe? Well, we actually see, with real science, around 205. That's roughly around 6,000 years worth of supernova remnants. How about that? But nature found a way. And then you need planetary evolution. Again, we've never actually seen a planet form through their suggested guess. But if their theory were correct, we expect the planets and the sun, due to numerous laws of science, to rotate in the same direction, and they are not. So we know that Venus, Uranus, and possibly Pluto rotate backwards. Also, let's think. If the gas of the sun and our planets of this solar system are made of the same gas and the same dust, then why are they so different from each other? Different in size is elemental composition, atmospheres, chemicals, so forth and so on. And also, it's interesting. According to the evolutionary guess, they predicted the sun should be spinning really quickly in the middle of our solar system. And a planet's orbiting fairly slowly in comparison. What do we observe? The opposite. The sun rotates slowly, and a planet's orbit really quickly. And it's perfect just the way it is. Because since the sun rotates slowly, it doesn't fling its matter into our solar system. Therefore, we don't get burned alive. I hear that's good. All right? Just say it. And then since the 
planets orbit fairly quickly. We don't get sucked in by the sun's gravitational pull. Again, we don't get burned alive. Again, it's a good thing, and it's perfect just the way it is. But a real conundrum for the evolutionist. But nature found a way. And then you need organic evolution, the origin of life from non-life. And this is a huge problem for the non-believer. Paul Davies, a well-recognized expert in this field, not a creationist, says nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organize themselves into the first living cell. No even good ideas. Truly not. And it's such a problem that many secularists today are buying into the idea of something called panspermia. You heard of panspermia? I bet you have, or at least you've seen it in a couple different movies, more than likely. Panspermia, or directed panspermia, is the idea that aliens came and seeded life on this planet, and it evolved from there. Sound a little more familiar now? You see the idea a lot in movies. Uh, to give you an example of this, let me show you a clip from the movie Expelled, hosted by Ben Stein. Anybody remember Ben Stein? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller, Scott are on reference, okay, maybe a couple, okay, so good video, we don't agree with everything in the video, but overall, well done, and in this clip I'm going to show you, he's talking to a guy named Richard Dawkins, Dr. Richard Dawkins, anybody know who Richard Dawkins is? Quite a few of you, okay, he's what I like to call an atheist evangelist, that's what he is, he feels like it's his purpose in life to let you know you have no purpose in life, all right, so that's what he goes around, that's his message of hope to the world, all right, not a very good message of hope, but anyway. And he's a brilliant guy. He is very smart. But here's something I will, I will repeat a lot today and for the rest of the conference. Guys, he, this is not a head issue. It is a heart issue. And thus becomes a worldview issue. Because this guy's brilliant. He's not dumb, but it's not a head issue. It's a heart issue. Listen to this clip, and as you watch it, just bear in mind this is ultimately a worldview issue, a heart issue. I, I put an argument in the book. Well, then who did create the heavens and the earth? Why do you use the word who? You see, you, you, you immediately beg the question by using the word who. Well, then how did it get created? <laughs> well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, no. no, no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means, to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but that I'm... higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design just certain types of designers, such as God. Missed it by that much, all right? So close in some ways and so far off in others. You know, here's the thing that's interesting to me. Why is Richard Dawkins okay with the idea of aliens creating life and not God, and even leaving evidence of their creation, but not God? Here's what I suggest, more than likely, what the Bible says. Romans 1, that the unrighteous suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. They don't want God to be there because if he is, we're accountable to him. Because if God made us, or I'm sorry, if aliens made us, we are not morally accountable to aliens. But if God made us, he owns us, he sets the rules, and we're accountable to him. And sinful man does not like that idea. And so they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. And we get answers like that. That's really what's going on here. 
And why has he got such a problem with this issue of the origin of life from non-life? Well, because there's a law of science called the law of biogenesis, which says life only comes from, guess what? Life. That's all we've ever observed. We have never seen a rock give birth to anything. If you do, run away. (laughs) It's not good, all right? Not good. Evolution violates this law as well. Also, inside life, we find a whole lot, staggering amounts of genetic information called DNA. And the second law of information says information always originates from a mind, always. Now, once you have it, you can make copies of it, but the origin of information is always a mind. Yet evolution suggests that all the the information inside living things came from non-living matter. It violates this law as well. But nature found a way. And then that leads us to this possible definition some people, some people use sometimes. That is macroevolution, the changing of one kind into a whole different kind. And this is what most people really think of when you say the word evolution. It's the idea that all life shares a common ancestor from billions of years ago that branched off to form everything we see today. It's the idea that many scientists believe today that some dinosaurs evolved into birds. It's the idea that humans and apes today share a common ape-like ancestor from the past. That's macroevolution. Uh, we like to call it molecules to man evolution at the ministry. It's a nice, all-encompassing definition. The bottom one, though, is my favorite. It's the goo to you via the zoo theory. <laughs> you started off as goo, and we get to you. How? Through the zoo. Fish, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. If you can just remember the word farm, that's the suggested order of evolution. And that's what Darwin ultimately concluded in his book, The Origin of Species, which, by the way, Darwin made some decent observations. It's true, but nothing new. And then he came to some really, really wrong and bad conclusions, conclusions like this one. It's a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all space and time should be related to each other. That's right. You are related to birds, monkeys, bananas, and even nuts. Maybe that's your family. I don't know, all right? But that's not... (laughs) It's <laughs> what the textbooks teach, like this one. Uh, you are an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms. Was anybody depressed when you came in today? Did you need some encouragement? So <laughs> that'll be out a little bit. So let's kind of recap very quickly what the evolutionary ideology is suggesting we embrace by faith because it's never been observed. They're suggesting that we believe that around 14 billion years ago, nothing exploded and produced everything. And from the chaos of an explosion, you get the orderliness of the universe, galaxies, and solar systems. That goes against many other known laws of science if we had time. Then somehow the earth formed around four and a half billion years ago. It's a hot, molten mass. Opposite of what the Bible says, God created it covered in water. And then it rained on the rocks for millions of years, and those rocks came alive on that organic soup around 3.5 billion years ago. So that would have to be Grandpa. And then after the rocks came alive, they evolved into simple simple single cell things, and eventually into humans, but we were a lot of things in between bacteria and humans. Discover Magazine 2004, was your ancestor a sea sponge? And inside it declares emphatically, this is your ancestor, to which I can only respond. <laughs> saying. If you're going to make it that easy, I can't not hit that one. All right. (laughs) And supposedly man evolved on the scene around 3 million years ago. So that's what the evolution scenario is suggesting we believe by faith. So problems with with this idea of macroevolution, one kind changing to another. Uh, Here's the first problem right here. (laughs) Uh, We don't see it happening today, do we? And praise God, those are some weird-looking critters, right? Nobody saw the, uh, uh, the gator frog or the literal bird dog, banana fish, the great white horse, the lion of roo, or the squirrelosaurus. I'm glad he's not around, all right? <laughs> that would be awful. <laughs> no, yeah. We don't see one kind change into a whole different kind. Now, to be fair, if there was an evolutionist up here with me, he'd say, but Brian, you're being silly. Of course we don't see this happening today because evolution happens to what? Do you know? Slowly. And I would still argue, okay, but if it did happen at all, there should be some observable change. Or even right now, like an arm changing to a wing, you know, a gill into a lung or something like that. There should be something. But okay, I'll give you that. 
let's say it does happen too slowly to observe, then where should the evidence be for these mass changes over time? It should be where? It should be in the fossil record. There should be literally trillions of these intermediate links in the fossil record. And guys, they're just not there. More on that tonight later on. We'll talk about Noah's Ark and Flood and so forth. But a little, just one little quote to drive this home for now. Um, Dr. Colin Patterson. Senior paleontologist at the Natural History Museum in London, staunch evolutionist, has access to one of the largest fossil collections in the entire world, right? And uh, he wrote a book on evolution. But here was what, what was interesting. In his book, he included no examples of transitions. None. Not one. And he's a staunch evolutionist, has access to all these fossils at his museum. And so someone noticed that, and they wrote him a letter and said, Sir, why did you not include any transitions in your book? And here was his very honest response. He said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil living, I would certainly include them. I will lay it on the line. There's not one such fossil. They're just not there. There's a handful the evolutionists are one to argue over, but there should be trillions that are undeniable. They are just not there. And it's a real problem. And it's such a problem that sometimes some scientists will go to great lengths to make the evidence fit their preconceived ideas. Have you guys ever heard of Lucy? Australopithecines, afarensis, right? Just means southern ape. Uh, well, here's the thing about Lucy's bones. When they found Lucy's bones, they were all like the bones of a chimp. All of them. And her hips are angled in such a way she should walk on all fours normally. Now, she could waddle on two legs like chimps today, but would typically walk on all fours. But her discoverers did not want her to walk on all fours because that means she's just a chimp. And who cares if you find a dead chimp? They wanted to find a hominid, a transition from ape to human. So they wanted to reinterpret her hips to fit their worldview, to fit their assumptions. And watch what some scientists did to make the evidence fit their preconceived ideas. And as you watch this, just bear in mind, it's not a head issue, it's a heart issue. And bear in mind the power of your starting assumptions, the power of your worldview. The ape that stood up, it was a revolutionary idea. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones had been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together in later fossilization. After Lucy died, some of her bones lying in the mud must have been crushed or broken, perhaps by animals browsing at the lake shore. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they're in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bones seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. You think? Keep grinding it down, right? Make it look like whatever you want it to look like. And I'm not picking on these guys. They're brilliant. They're very, very smart. But again, not a head issue. It's a heart issue. And I would even say this. I would go as far to say they are being consistent with their worldview. They are. 
God's word is not true. There must be a naturalistic explanation. Evolution, therefore, is the answer. So somehow these things have to line up with the evolutionary worldview. So they're trying really hard to make this evidence fit their preconceived ideas. But the reason they get such wonky conclusions is because they're starting with the wrong assumptions. They need to start with God's word, not man's. That's the bottom line issue. And you see, on top of that, arranging animals or fossils in order on paper does not prove a relationship. Even if you find them buried in a particular order, it doesn't prove a relationship. If later on you find me buried on top of a hamster, it doesn't mean he's my grandpa. All right? Just throwing that out there. But for those who think arranging things in a particular order proves a relationship of some sort, I want to show you some of my research I've been doing. I've been trying to figure out the evolution of the fork. It's just really important to me. And so... I've determined over the years that the fork started off as something like a knife maybe 500 million years ago. Why the knife? Because that is the simplest structure. And then over eons of time, natural selection, mutations, geological pressures, the fork, or I'm sorry, the knife evolved into the spoon. And you see the similarities in the handles, but they changed towards the top with the concave convex structure of the spoon. Now, there used to be bigger spoons a long time ago, but they died out during a mass extinction event a few hundred million years ago. And then because of more geological pressures, more natural selection, and so forth, the spoon eventually evolved into the fork. And you can see the grooves get deeper over time. There it is, the beautiful evolution of the fork. And I was so proud of myself, I thought, I've finally done it. But as I looked at that more and more, I realized I had a missing link. There was something in between the spoon and the fork. I wasn't sure what it was. And I got real hungry, and I went to Kentucky Fried Chicken, and I placed my order, and the lady just handed me the missing link. What did she hand me? A fork, that's right. Discovered that Kentucky Fried Chicken where all good things are discovered. (laughs) So there it is, the beautiful evolution of the fork. Very, very clear. It cannot be argued. You can even explain the so-called races. It's not hard to do. There you go, right there. (laughs) <laughs> I'll, I'll stop. Uh, but <laughs> you get the idea, right? Just because I can arrange, thi- arrange things in a particular order and th- then tell a story to go with that order, does that prove my story itself is true? No, not at all, right? Same thing with the fossils in the rock layers. What do we actually observe with the fossil record? Well, we observe billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. If there was a global flood, guess what we expect to find? Billions of dead things, buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. Tremendous confirmation of the Bible's historicity, which we'll talk about more tonight when we talk about the flood. But back to macroevolution. Summary for the evidence of macroevolution. We don't see it in the present, nor in the fossil record, nor is there an observable mechanism in the present to make the idea even plausible. We'll get to that one here in a moment. But before we do, notice, very important, these first four meanings to the word evolution are believed by faith. None of them have ever been observed. Actually, you might even call it a blind faith because they reject known laws of science to hang on to their beliefs about this theory. But that leads us to the last possible definition. I don't like it. I don't like the title. I think it's misleading uh, at best, deceptive at worst, but something some people call microevolution. We simply call this variations within the kind, adaptation, speciation, variation, Did you realize this is what the Bible teaches? We'll get to that here in a moment. But it's just the idea that lizards make lizards. That's all it is. Bigger lizards, variations within the lizards, different sizes, different colors, but they're always still lizards. And lo and behold, this is what the Bible teaches from Genesis 1. From the very beginning, ten times. God created distinct types of plants and animals to reproduce according to their kind. And the word kind, for the most part, is equal to about the family level of modern-day classification. So according to the Bible, God made the dog kind, and within the dog kind, it produces variations of, guess what? Dogs, you're brilliant, all right? That's exactly what it is. That's what we see. It's what the Bible teaches. Uh, elephants make what? Elephants. Cats make what? Unfortunately, right? You get the idea. <laughs> so whether really you talk about my dog, Samson here, a great day, and he's a big dog. Or little dogs like the Chihuahua, I think they still count as a dog, I'm not really sure. All right, lots of variation, but they're both still dogs. Same thing with horses, you can make all sorts of really neat horses. You can make Zorses and Z-donks if you would like. You can breed them together, same kind of animal. You can make a stripless zebra. Here's a zebra with no PJs, kind of sad. Uh, here's a Z-donk we have at the Creation Museum. Here's a Zorse we have at the Creation Museum. Uh, you can make lepons if you want. You can breed lions and leopards. They're the same kind of animal. If you liked the movie Napoleon Dynamite, I've got great news for you. 
ligers are real. All right, they, you can breed lions and tigers. Why? Because they're the same kind of animal. Picture taken by National Geographic. Tons of variation out there, no doubt. Variations happen, but variations have limits. Think about it like this. Farmers have been trying to breed bigger pigs for a long time. Will they ever get a pig as big as Texas? No, there's a limit in there somewhere, right? That might happen, you know, maybe when um, this happens. <laughs> but hey, if there were not limits, why not breed wings on your pigs and make them fly? That'd be incredible. But there are limits, right? Roaches do become resistant to pesticides through a loss of genetic information. Will they ever become resistant to a sledgehammer? I hope not, right? It's going to be a really bad day if they do. So what causes these variations in our Genesis 3 fallen cursed world? Two main things. Natural selection and mutations. And guys, no rational, informed person argues that things don't change. Of course they change. The questions are, how much do they change, and which direction is that change going? Is it an onward, upward progression, changing a molecule into a man, a fish into a philosopher, or maybe a mixing and loss of genetic information over time? What do we actually observe? And here's the thing. In order for natural selection and mutations to lead to the idea of macroevolution, to change a molecule into a man, here's what they must, must must do. They must add brand new genetic information over time. They must. Because, for example, if you're going to change a dinosaur into a bird, you need new genetic information, don't you? New information for new eyes, new lungs, new heart, new nerve system, new bone structure, new feathers, new instincts, new everything. And that requires brand new, specified, organized, complicated genetic information. If these things don't add that, macroevolution is genetically and biologically impossible to begin with. So let's look at these two things really quickly. Natural selection. I think we're all kind of familiar with the term survival of the fittest. That's essentially what it is. By the way, that does not explain arrival of the fittest. That's a different question. It's basically an organism's ability to adapt to their environment because of genetic variation. You see, organisms can adapt a lot because there's a lot of information inside living things to produce these variations. There's so much we really can't comprehend it, but let me give you an illustration to try to drive the point home. The estimated number of atoms in the universe is 10 to the 80th power. That's a one followed by 80 zeros. It's beyond our comprehension. But that number is nothing compared to this number. Because of the amazing amount of genetic information inside of human beings, it's been estimated that the number of children that one man and one woman can have, one at a time, without any two of those kids being genetically the same, is this number. And you thought you had a big family, right? <laughs> And think about it, God put that kind of variability into the doll kind, into the cat kind, into humans, and that's why we see so much variation. So can natural selection lead to the idea of macroevolution, change a molecule into a man? And even most evolutionists today agree the answer is no. Why? Because natural selection does not add new genetic information. It just works on what's already there. It's kind of nature's quality control. Let me give you an example of this. Let's say you get two dogs who get off Noah's Ark. And they get married and have kids, and their kids get married and have kids, and their kids get married and have kids, and you end up with a typical homeschooling family. Now, <laughs> I'm homeschooling, it's okay, all right? So anyway. Uh, <laughs> and so let's say you get a population that builds up with different combinations of genes, and different combinations will survive better in different environments. But let's say the founding parents of this population had genetic information for S, short hair, and L, long hair. Of course, it's more complicated than this, but the principles hold true. These parents could produce a bunch of variations, right? They could pass on both short-haired genes and make dogs with really short hair, pass on a short-haired gene and long-haired gene and make dogs with medium-length hair, or pass on both long-haired genes and create hairy. Right? Pretty straightforward. So let's say a segment of, of this population with these different variations goes up north where it is cold. Well, in that environment, the dogs with short hair and medium-length hair will get cold. They will freeze, and then they will die. <laughs> if that makes you sad, they can move away. All right, whatever, whatever works for you, all right. Either way, after a while, they are no longer in that, uh, in that environment. All you have in that environment are dogs with long hair, which on their own only produce dogs with, guess what? Long hair. That is natural selection in action. Now notice, through that process, did you add genetic information or did you lose it? 
You actually lost it, right? You lost the information for short hair. They have less information than they started with. And if the environment changes, these guys are in trouble. They can't adapt like they used to. And, so, and of course, do the opposite. Some dogs go where it's hot in that environment. The dogs with long hair and medium length hair, they will overheat and die or move away, all right? And then you have dogs with short hair, which only produce dogs with short hair. Again, that's a loss of information, not a gain. And through this process, we, do, we, got, we get all sorts of variations of dogs, no doubt about it. But you know what? They were dogs. They are dogs. They will be dogs. That's not Darwinian evolution, macroevolution. That's just dogs. And again, even most evolutionists today would agree with this. Yes, natural selection can't do it on its own. But they'll say, there is something else out there that does add the information we need to change a molecule into man. And that amazing ingredient will be mutations. I'll say mutations are the source of variation within a population like this textbook says. So they must be pretty fascinating, pretty awesome things, these mutations to change a molecule into a man. So what are they? Well, the classic definition of a mutation is when genetic information is damaged or changed. They are random, they are rare, they are very harmful, mostly harmful, and very often they are lethal. Actually, this secular scientist says the great majority of mutations, well over 99%, are harmful in some way, as is to be expected from accidental occurrences. Mutations are accidents within your genome. They're typos within your DNA. Got a question from you guys. I want to answer from you, just your life experience. When you have an accident, or, or one of your kids has an accident, does that tend to make things more organized or less? Usually less, right? Usually make things a lot worse, right? It doesn't take much either. Mutations are very, very bad. As the secular scientist says, no matter how numerous mutations may be, they do not produce any kind of macro evolution. Why? Because they rearrange or delete existing genetic information. They do not add it. And that is crucial. They just work on what's already there, planted there by the creator, corrupted by the fall. Think about it this way. The letters from the word Christmas. You could delete some of those letters, rearrange the other letters, and make all sorts of words. As, Matt, Sam, Ram, and so forth. But you would never get the words Xerox, Zebra, or Queen. Why? The letters are not available. Same thing with mutation. So, for example, here's some practical examples. Here's a five-legged bull. No new information, just a repeat of what he already had and detrimental to his health. Here's a short-legged sheep. That's a loss of information, Right? I know he's cute, but that poor guy is going to be the first one that the wolf eats. <laughs> because you can't run but so fast with those little legs. Just throwing it out there. Poor guy. Here's a two-headed turtle. It's mutant. It's not ninja, but it is a mutant. Uh, <laughs> not even one mutation. According to this secular scientist, not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information. Indeed, all mutations destroy information. None can serve as an example of macro evolution. And guys, this is a devastating argument against the plausibility of the idea of evolution. Now Richard Dawkins once was asked this very question by a journalist. I want you to hear his response. Um, he was asked, give me one example of mutation that adds genetic information. Just one. I want you to listen to his response. And I don't often agree with an atheist, but I, I think this time he nails it. Can you give an example of a genetic mutation or, 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 or an evolutionary process which ha can be seen to increase the information in the genome? And he doesn't come up with one. All right, I'm not trying to pick on him. Again, he's a very smart guy, but it's not a head issue. It's a what? It's a heart issue. You see, ultimately, mutations are terrible things for explaining the origin of genetic information, new genetic information. They're perfect for explaining the origin of death, disease, and destruction. That's what they do when they mess up the genome. And people say, but wait a minute, what about mutations that cause, you know, antibiotic resistance in bacteria? Isn't that, you know, evolution? And the answer is no, that still involves information loss. One quick example as we begin to round third here and come home. Um, Ace pylori, a mean little critter, did, ba did bad stuff to humans, does bad stuff to humans, I should say. And uh, we needed to get rid of H. pylori. I call it HP for short. So here's how we killed HP. We created an antibiotic that we knew it would absorb through its 
cell wall. And we placed the poison inside the antibiotic. Now, once it got inside, HP has things called enzymes that we knew about. And enzymes break stuff down, and they will break down the antibiotic and thus release the poison we have placed inside, killing HP from the inside out. Make sense? Kind of like a Trojan horse, pretty straightforward. And so this was working really, really well until we ran into HP's mutant cousin, Henry. <laughs> we just call him Henry. Uh, and see, Henry had a problem. Henry did not have the enzymes all normal HPs had. And so therefore, normally he'd be weaker than all the others. And he, he was sad about that. But it turns out it, to be very beneficial for him in that environment because here's what happened. When he absorbed the antibiotic we created, once it went inside of him, since he had no enzyme, there was never any conversion of the poison. Therefore, he did not die. Ha, ha, ha. He survives. Now notice, did Henry survive because he had more genetic information or less? Less. He did not have the enzyme all the normal bacteria had. Now it turns out to be beneficial, but still a net loss of genetic information, loss of, of a trait. And so he survived because of less information, a loss of a trait, not an addition of. And so because bacteria reproduce very quickly, he takes over the population, but still an overall loss of genetic information. So all we ever observe Guys, through natural selection and mutations, are new combinations of already existing genetic information with less variability than they started with, and that's the opposite of what you would need for the idea of macroevolution to be true. And some people say, well, okay, but yeah, but just give it enough time. And all those small changes will add up to big changes. But wait, these small changes, are they adding or subtracting? They tend to be subtracting over time. So added up over time, right? And I love this quote from this scientist to rebut that idea. I think it does so very well. He says, whoever thinks macroevolution can be made by mutations that lose information is like the merchant who lost a little money on every sale but thought he could make it up with volume, <laughs> which sounds like our government, all right? But <laughs> yeah, exactly. So do animals evolve? To answer the question directly, well, define your terms. Are you talking about variation, adaptation, speciation, what some people call microevolution, what the Bible teaches from Genesis 1 on? Absolutely. We all agree with that. It's what the Bible teaches, what we observe with real science. No questions whatsoever. We all agree. But if by evolution you mean what some people call macroevolution, changing one kind into another, uh, everything comes, shares a common uh, ancestor from the past, dinosaurs evolved into birds, no. We don't believe in that because that's believed by some by faith in spite of the facts. It's actually a blind faith. And micro will not lead to macro because they're going in opposite directions. And here's the thing. Typically, as a ministry, as we talk about this issue, we don't break this term down like this all the time. It's just too much work. You have to go through all the different definitions. Typically, when we, when we say the word evolution, we mean the whole theory. Molecules to man. Sometimes we say molecules to man evolution. But here's why I broke it down for us today. Because I wanted to demonstrate something. I want to show you how multiple generations and millions of kids today have essentially been brainwashed, if you will, into the idea that evolution must be true. And therefore, if it's true, the Bible's history is false. And if the Bible's history is false, then why on earth trust what it says about salvation? I mean, have rejected this book and, just, and thus rejected the gospel. And they've, been, they've been tricked by a logical fallacy called uh, the fa logical fallacy of equivocation or bait and switch. And that's when, in the course of an argument... You use a word to prove your point. And the first time you use that word, you mean one thing. And then later on in that same argument, you use that same word again, but this time you use it in a different way to try to prove your original point. It's a logical fallacy. Let me show you what I mean. This is what you'll see all the time. Oh, hear me on this. If you're in school or parents, hear me on this. This is what you'll see all the time in your textbooks when you listen to one of the speakers like Richard Dawkins or uh, Stephen Hawking's or... NOVA, National Geographic, you hear this all the time. They'll say, we know evolution is true. And when the first time they say the word evolution, they're applying the whole theory. Molecules to man evolution, macroevolution, usually also incorporating cosmic evolution. The whole theory is true, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Well, how do we know? And then they'll say, well, because we see evolution happening all the time. And they will almost microevolution. Let's say, look, all these dogs, all these other sorts of dogs that proves we came from Iraq billions of years ago. Darwin's finches make all these other sort of what? Finches. 
the person we share a common ancestor from billions of years ago, and on and on it goes. Logical fallacy. Let me give you an example of this indoctrination taking place from a video called Evolution versus God done by Ray Comfort, really well done. He goes onto some college campuses, and he's asking for evidence of Darwinian evolution. And listen to the responses he gets from the professors and kids. It's the same thing over and over again. It's like they have been brainwashed. Here you go. You said you mean the evolution of another to another. Yes, we have that in action, actually, in the Galapagos. Could you uh, give me one instance? Yes, we have an example from a group of birds called Darwin's finches. And you take a look at the difference between the finches on the islands that all started out. I mean, that's very, very observable. But that's not Darwinian evolution. There's been no change of kind. What do the finches become? They become genetically new and anatomically new, recognizably different species. So they're still finches? Well, of course they're still finches, yes. So they're not a change of, there's no change of kind. The little birds that he, uh, that he had observed that... Oh, what did they become? Um, their beaks, their beak shapes. They're their still color. birds. Yes, three finches that turn into different types of birds. Based They're still the finches. Well, for example, Darwin and, and his study on evolution of uh, the birds on the island that he went on to there. Their beaks changed? Their beaks. Uh, They're still birds. There's no change of kinds. That's within no, 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 the kind. evolution on the beaks. That's so that's the... called adaptation. It's not Darwinian evolution. There's no change of kinds. There's no different animal involved. I want something that shows me Darwin's belief in a change of kinds is scientific. Pretty sure he just blew her mind. Uh, <laughs> she's like, what? Uh, but in case that did not convince you, this professor will convince you with a stickleback fish. Here you go. The scientific method is, must be observable and repeatable. So could you give me one piece of observable evidence for Darwinian evolution? Okay, I would point to, as one great example is, look at the genetics of the stickleback. What's that? Uh, so stickleback fish are a very interesting collection of species that were recently isolated after the end of the Ice Age. What have they become? They're, they're various species of sticklebacks. They stayed as fish? Well, of course. Bottom line, when you start with the wrong assumptions, you can make some good observations and still reach the wrong conclusions. Reminds me of the story of some scientists who want to see how high a frog could jump as they progressively cut off its legs one at a time. So they took a frog, put him on the ground, and they said, jump frog, with all four legs, he jumped 80 inches. They picked him up, cut off one more leg, or put, cut off a leg, put him on the ground, and they said, jump frog, and with three legs, he jumped 70 inches. They picked him up, cut off a leg, put him back down, and they said, jump frog, and he jumped 60 inches with two legs. Picked him up, cut off a leg, put him back down, and they said, jump frog, and with one leg, he jumped 50 inches. That's impressive. They picked up the frog, cut off the last leg, no more legs, put the frog back on the ground, and they said, jump frog. Now, they expected he might jump around 40 inches based on the progression of the data. All right, actual jump was zero, so they yelled louder. Jump, frog! Frog did not move. They yelled even louder. Jump, frog! Frog did not move. They were baffled. So they tried the experiment again with a new frog, and they got the same results every time. So they took all their data, they put their data together, they said, you know what? The frog jumped less as the legs were removed. It's a good observation, I guess, right? But then they concluded that a frog with no legs goes deaf. That's right. <laughs> Some of y'all get that later on. Don't worry about it. No. Bad conclusion. Same thing we see today, folks. Good observations that through natural selection and mutations, things do change. But then the bad conclusion that those things that cause small changes, reducing genetic information, can add up to big changes over time. Real science rejects evolutionary ideology and confirms what we read from God's Word from the very first verse. And what I want to encourage you with, with this particular talk, is to show you that when you stand on God's Word, what we see in God's world confirms what we read in God's Word. You can trust this book and stand on it authoritatively. It's right about everything. Why? Because it is God's Word. And when we stand on it, we can defend the faith and then share the gospel in a very secular culture. And here's the thing. These answers are so important uh, because in our day and age, we live in a culture. We'll talk more about this next session. But we live in a culture where many, especially the younger generations, they don't believe the gospel. Why? They don't believe the book from which the gospel comes. That's why. And for older generations, we've kind of missed that. My, from mine, b uh, before mine. We've kinda grew, we grew up in a culture where the Bible is assumed to be true. And so we just kind of believe the gospel as a result in some way, shape, or form. Not these generations. No, no, no. 
they've grown up in a culture that said this book's been disproven. And so they don't trust the gospel from this book. It's a different culture. And that's why these sort of answers are needed. And that's why we're so passionate about this stuff. And that's why we bring resources. Not to uh, make money or anything like that. You know, the point is to equip you and the coming generations to defend their faith so kids don't fall away and we can proclaim the gospel to an ever secularized culture. That is the point. So we got so many, we bring things with us to equip you. Uh, Things like the answers book. Each book answers around 25 to 35 different questions. Great resources. Some of the best-selling apologetic books in the world. And it's so important to get these in your hands. And here's why. Um, I talk fast. Amen? No doubt about that. I'm trying to cover a whole lot of information. Uh, Within three days, how much of what I said do you think you'll remember percentage-wise? According to studies. Yeah, it's <laughs> that's what everybody go away with. Frogs go death. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, studies show less than ten percent, and that makes me sad. I'm working hard up here, right? But my whole goal is really not for you to remember everything, but just to show you there are answers to encourage you to get them more on your own. And so when you do forget three days from now, get a book or a DVD to remind you to share it with your kids, to share it with your family, so you can equip yourselves and those you love to defend their faith and proclaim the gospel. And that's what these are about. We've got those for teens and for kids. We've got so many other books, books for kids. Now, these are age appropriate. We've got DVDs for teens and ADD adults, all sorts of different ones. I'll tell you more about them in detail later on, but just so you know they're there. And the point is to equip you to defend the faith and share the gospel and all sorts of great issues. There's a special for the entire conference that goes through tonight and through actually tomorrow night as well. We'll have two sessions this morning, two tonight, and two tomorrow night. We've got the U2 special. Any combination of books or DVDs for those prices in the back. And so three for 35, five for 55, on down the line it goes. The more you buy, the more you save. Once you get up to this, 30 for 199 it's around six fifty per item, six dollars and fifty cents per book or per DVD, and it's just a great way to get a lot of resources to equip yourselves and your family to defend the faith. We got an incredible magazine, one of the best-selling Christian magazines in the world, just been updated. It's phenomenal. I encourage you to check that out. The begin book for sharing the gospel by using creation evangelism, giving the gospel, answering questions. Really powerful tool for evangelism. That's only three bucks here. Normally twelve, thirteen dollars. Really great deal. Sign up for the newsletter. Go to Answers to Genesis if you like free stuff. Our website has thousands of articles, hundreds of videos free on the website. Take advantage of that. And then I'll leave you one last quote, and then we'll be, I'll pray, and we'll take a break. Get ready for next, for the main session. But just to remind us about how important this issue is, let me give you a quote from an atheist, because atheists tend to understand why this is so important better than most Christians do. Listen to what this atheist says. The most devastating thing that biology did to Christianity was the discovery of evolution. Now that we know Adam and Eve never existed, they never were real people, the central myth of Christianity has been destroyed. Follow his logic, it is sound. If there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was original sin. If there never was original sin, there's no need of salvation. No need of salvation means there's no need of a Savior. That's right. And I submit, that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, in the ranks of the unemployed, I believe evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. If the Bible's history is not true, why trust what it says about salvation? That's why it's so important. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for a chance to gather under the banner of Christ, to lift up your name, your word, and your truth, to exalt you to demolish arguments that raise themselves up against your knowledge, not not for our pride, but for your glory and for your truth, and for the gospel. I pray that you'll put a burden in our hearts um, for uh, a love of you, for a love of your word, for uh, give us a love for a lost and dying world, that we would proudly and boldly stand on the authority of God's word and proclaim the truth of your word, defending our faith, and then proclaiming the gospel to a very pagan culture who's definitely deviated from the truth of your word, that we would call for a return to the authority of God's word, starting in the church and in our homes, and stand on your word. Defend the faith, share the gospel, all for your glory. God, we love you, we praise you, thank you again, be exalted. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.